Welcome to Schooling Around. Today we sit down with Oxford Superintendent Tim Throne and talk about what to do next after another school shooting. Then we go to Oxford Early Childhood and talk with Washia Jackson and Pat Mueller about how things like this need to be nipped in the bud. Stay tuned. It's been around three weeks now since we turned the news on and learned that 17 more people died in a school shooting, this time in Parkland, Florida. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is much like Oxford, not on the wrong side of the tracks or a poor area, just average everyday people. We thought this would be a good time to sit down with our own superintendent, Tim Throne, to have a conversation about all of this as it relates to us right here. I caught up with Tim after a school board meeting the other night. It's, it's been a few days now since the, the tragedy in Florida. And unfortunately, this seems to be a recurring sort of thing. I have to think that from your perspective as superintendent, you're starting to communicate even more intensely with the staff as you move around from school to school about this sort of thing. Yep. Please share with us the kinds of things you're talking about. So let me start out by saying, John, from a process standpoint, uh, I'll be sending out a, a letter um, to the entire community. Um, it'll be shared with our, our parents, community members in general. We'll post it on our website just about the, the recent events and um, and our uh, our resolve of trying to make Oxford Community Schools as safe as possible for our students and, and our employees. Um, a couple other process things, a few times throughout the year I will attend staff meetings in our buildings and it just so happens that actually today uh, was the um, one of the first staff meetings I attended in this next round and so within uh, maybe a week or two period of time I will attend staff meetings at all of our buildings all of our programs and it's a chance for me to just um, talk with our employees um, maybe share with them anything special that's going on. More importantly, it's a time for me to hear back from our employees what they want me to hear. And so I am confident that I will hear from our employees in regards to um, the things that they appreciate as far as what we've done when it comes to safety and security. But I'm sure they will also share their ongoing concerns and um, you know, maybe even suggestions or things like that 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 they want to uh, to make sure that I hear. the The last thing from a process standpoint is that we do have an ongoing uh, safety co uh, committee that's comprised of um, first responders, local officials. There's township, village people there, um, parents, students, staff, employees. We've got a, a, a really good representation from, from a lot of our stakeholders. And that, that safety committee meets um, usually twice a year. Uh, last time it met was back in August and it's meeting again in a couple of weeks. And so in my letter that I share with the community, um, I remind them of that just from a, a standpoint that, you know, if there's um, something specific or ideas or, um, things that they want to make sure that um, that they get a chance to either say or or submit to the committee I give instructions in that letter on how to do that and that's basically just to contact Sam Barna um, who's our assistant soup of finance and operations he chairs that committee and um, not everybody can can make the meeting and that kind of stuff but they certainly can get a hold of Sam 
and um, submit information or concerns or things that maybe they want the community or the committee to um, address and discuss. And so um, that's just internally how we, we sort of, um, you know, address these types of things. Un unfortunately, it is. It's a it's an ongoing topic that I wish we didn't have to discuss. I wish we didn't have to have a, an ongoing committee. Um, but um, that's, that's not the world in which we live. We're hearing a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, everything from teachers being armed to uh, more intense scrutiny of mental health, mm -hmm. uh, and everything in between. What kind of things are you hearing from, from our teachers as you make the rounds? Yeah, so I think um, sometimes when you get complicated issues, we want to oversimplify them and think that there's simple answers and that's not true. At the same time, I think sometimes for whatever reason we've we made things in our world more complicated than what they should be. Uh, so I'll, I'll say it this way. Um, do we know that we want to take every um, reasonable pre precaution um, in regards to safety? Yes. And, and I think we've done uh, many things. Uh, most recently, we installed some, some night guard devices that basically we can ensure that the doors are are um, secured in a manner that doesn't involve teachers going out in the hallways to lock doors. They can shut the door, install the device, and and secure that that door, of that room. Um, you know, we 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 lock do down doors after school starts up, and those types of things. And so, um, a lot of good things we've done. Um, when I first became superintendent, it's almost three years now. Um, you know, one of the one of the first things that we did was we uh, brought back our police liaison officer up at the high school, and um, Jason Lord has has been a great addition, and we utilize him uh, tremendously, and so um, that's a piece of the puzzle. We've we've had a um, a security guard uh, at the high school for many years and that's uh, Mr. Rourke and and he does a tremendous job with the students and has established some some really good relationships not only with the students but with the staff and so um, you know we we take action in those areas. Next we talk with Tim about guns, teachers, and security. Lots of talk about solutions to school security. More with Superintendent Tim Throne. Well, there's been a lot of talk lately about the um, the arming of our staff, and so um, I, I get a lot of different input. Um, I get parent input, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is what I want to make sure that. Um, especially our employees and our teachers at this point hear me say we're, we're not going to take any type of action until we've really heard um, from our teachers if this is a direction they want to go. Let me say it another way. Do I think that we would probably have some teachers in our district in favor of, uh, of this idea or proposal? I do. Do I necessarily think that a majority or a large percentage would be in favor of arming teachers? Today I don't think so. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is, is while it is um, appropriate and 
needed discussion around a lot of these topics, I want our people to know, too, that we're not going to um, take any action until we really um, know, understand, and get the support of the people that we may be asking to do certain things. Um, and so that's, you know, that's just another idea. I, I think, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, as our safety committee continues to meet that we'll, we'll continue to get ideas. Um, as far as what will work in Oxford, I don't think that, again, while we want to paint with some really broad strokes, I don't even know sitting here today if if I would recommend the same types of safety and security measures for Oxford as even a neighboring district. They may have different needs or requirements or wants or expectations in their district from our district. And so for me, I need to be really clear with our students, with our employees and our community, what it is that they want and the expectations they have of our schools. Um, I was having a conversation the other day with somebody who um, I'll say immediately um, wanted to uh, install um, you know, metal detectors at all of our buildings, wanted um, I'll say to really fortify our buildings. And the concern I have with just jumping to a conclusion and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, is, is that um, I remember not too long ago, my second oldest uh, was involved in wrestling, and we went to a wrestling tournament, and I'm not going to say where the high school was. But I can tell you, when we pulled into the parking lot of that high school, well, there was hardly any windows. The windows that were on the building had bars over them. When we entered the door, it was through a metal detector. The hallways were um, I don't know, I'll just say pretty dark and uh, it definitely gave the impression and you didn't have a have any issue at all knowing where you were and the vibes that that, that building the physical structure gave off not only to my son but all the wrestlers they were talking about it do I necessarily think it's a good thing for our kids to come to school whether it's in an elementary building a middle school or a high school and feel like it's a prison that they're almost walking into, uh, a fortress such that I, I don't know if it if it would make our students feel any safer. It may make them feel even worse. Some final thoughts with our superintendent after this. Obviously, this discussion will be ongoing between our schools and our community. Some final thoughts from Tim Throne. I don't have any studies on this, but just my observation tells me this and my experience. The best way to keep our students and staff safe is to create an environment and have a culture where kids who are having problems get the help that they need. We identify that. Um, we do everything we possibly can, even if the school can't provide the services. Um, we make referrals and those types of things. 
but if our students and our staff can um, can be attentive and pay attention to uh, what other students are saying, what they're posting, what their actions are. If we're attentive and conscious of, of those things going on around us, I have hope that we can um, identify um, these uh, I don't know it these goes, people with, with, with issues before there's a chance for action to take place. It kind of goes right back to that inter internet safety training that was going on at our high school yep. a couple of weeks ago, three yep. or four weeks ago actually. Yep. Yeah. Tell me this, uh, I'm not trying to put you personally on the spot with this, but in, in your conversations with our teachers, and I know you haven't done a formal study or anything like this. Have you gotten a sense of should we or should we not do anything about the sale of assault rifles? I have not had that question or that discussion with teachers. Um, probably because that's outside of what we can control right now. It's really been spending the majority of my time discussing what are your thoughts on those things that we can. I think, I think at the end of the day, John, what I want our parents to know is that um, we, we don't take the safety of their students lightly. For many of us, our own kids come here. Um, and some of us, our kids have graduated and no longer attend these schools. But that doesn't mean that um, we, we hold safety and security any less. And so we don't take for granted every day when that parent puts their kid on the school bus or they drop their student off or the student walks to school, um, safety and security is, is paramount in, in the educational culture that we deliver. And so um, I just want our parents to know that we, we don't take it lightly. Um, it's always on the top of our list, and um, and they always can reach out to us. I mean, people have my my email, my phone number, uh, contact. We're we're constantly looking at things. We've um, maybe I'll just I'll end on this. We've been working with a, a local company, and we've actually been working on a product for almost a year now, a full year. Um, to help our help with the safety and security of our buildings and helping with um, first responders if something if something were to happen and while I'm not comfortable going public with that yet when that time comes I'll be more than happy to sit down with you and um, just talk about the time and energy and money we've put into trying to come up with solutions that fit for Oxford. As we read about the shooter in the Parkland incident, we realize that the issues he reacted to developed over time. Some ideas on that from our Oxford Early Learning Center after this. Washia Jackson is in charge of our Oxford Early Learning Center. Pat Mueller is her right hand. You may recall they just earned a five-star rating from the state of Michigan. That's the best. What you're about to see is part of a visit we planned a long time ago. Unfortunately, recent events made the significance of the subject matter even more relevant. You know, just when we think we've... we've kind of got a grip on stuff in our school, something new happens. Isn't that the truth? And, and we all know that now as I'm sitting down with you, what happened in Florida, terrible, terrible stuff. 
And I know you're in early childhood, and that was a, a high school situation, but it was still a school situation. You're right. What goes through the minds of you folks who, who deal with the little kids when you see something like that? My, my initial thought is what happened to you as a young child that made this happen? What, what, what clicked in your mind to think, I'm talking about from the point of view of the shooter. What clicked? What happened to you? What kind of trauma have you endured in your lifetime that made you think that this would be a good option? And I'm sure it must have been pretty traumatic. I mean, think of all that trauma. You think of all the things that he's been through. Now, please know I'm not being um, overly kind to the shooter, but my initial reaction is, good gracious, I have never in my life ever wanted to shoot another human being. That has never been something I wanted to do. I would imagine that most of us feel the same way. So what clicks in that person's mind to make that happen? And I kind of think what also goes through the minds of folks like you who deal with the little kids is what can I do to help these little kids get their minds going in the right direction so that they don't fall into a trap like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And keep them safe at the same time. You know, we don't want to over alert them and scare them even further, but we also want them to be vigilant. Right. I think about trauma and how it impacts a person. And we all handle trauma differently. Some people may become an introvert, and some mm -hmm. others may really um, become, a, become an extrovert. Um, so we all handle trauma in different ways. Um, and recognizing the signals or the signs that let us know that someone is in a state of um, stress, toxic stress that might elicit um, different types of behaviors um, and what do we do to support them in that process because children experience trauma um, all the time um, and we think of traumatic situations as death of a loved one um, potentially living in poverty or a high crime area um, divorce or separated parents um, physical and mental or emotional abuse is uh, another form of trauma um, having a loved one that a mother who is physically or mentally or emotionally bruised abused um, and potentially having someone that is verbally degrading is other um, forms of trauma and all of that trauma combined um, sometimes you see the results later, the action of that trauma come out in different ways with people. Um, so how do we support children? How do we help them become resilient um, and build that resilience that traumatic things happen, but what do I do in the face of calamity? How do I bounce back? Um, how do I have tenacity to know that this incident doesn't define me? Um, we provided a trauma training for our staff, how trauma at home can potentially cause trauma at school, and to try to look for those signals um, for our staff, and how do you become more empathetic and caring and compassionate, not only for the students, but sometimes also for your colleagues that may experience some trauma. Um, the training was absolutely um, wonderful and eye-opening. It promoted lots of dialogue as to what is trauma. And sometimes we don't realize that things are They're, traumatic to us. It, it, it's true. And sometimes it's just a matter of not um, feeling like you fit in. Or um, it, it doesn't always have to be a really serious, traumatic shooting. Sometimes trauma can be, like you say, divorce. Mm -hmm. People who fight. That's scary. When you're a young child, having ch people fight in front of you is terrifying. Having siblings that pick on you a lot can be very traumatizing. And before you know it, kids all of a sudden, by the time they get to be high schoolers, have never really dealt with this stress. And so what happens is it just blows. And it blows terribly. I had a conversation just yesterday with one of my closest friends who's a principal in another district, and she was saying one of her students came in, and he was crying. and. He said, you know, I'm just going through. 
and we kind of chuckled but he was so sincere he's like my grandmother passed away this is a seven-year-old who has bottled all of these traumatic experiences up in his life and he's acting out in class you know he can't sit still um, he's aggressive with other children he's hypersensitive um, to any type of structure sometimes and what happens when a child is always in a state of trauma or a toxic stress it is like the cortisone kicks in your body and you're constantly in this fight or flight mode which we know does not allow the brain to self-regulate or to have those higher order thinking skills because I am in a state of emotion. Um, so helping children to deal with those emotions and understand that those emotions are real and we all have a gamut of emotions, but it is the reaction kind of to those emotions that we are um, helping children to deal with and to build that resilience. A look at one of the primary causes of childhood trauma, next. Hey Leonard, you're watching OCTV. When you look at our society, one feature that has increased measurably over the last half century is divorce. More from Washia and Pat. We, we live in a complicated society, don't we? And, and I know it's been a long time coming. I'm thinking back to my own days in school. Okay, granted, I'm the old guy in the room. Um, I don't know I about think that. In, I think <laughs> in my, my, my class, or may have been, in a, in a class of, say, 60 kids, maybe two of them were had divorced parents. Mm -hmm. Today, what kind of percentage are we talking about? I think that... I think that typically they say about 50%. At least. At least. The other thing that happens is we just went through the Great Recession where people lost their homes, and they ended up moving in with, with other family members. Mm -hmm. So now you have a lot of people living in a small space. There's, there's, just, there's things like that that we just don't think about. The Kaiser Institute yeah. um, did this extensive study on adverse childhood experiences, and... Um, that is now one of the leading causes, you know, of um, some yes. of the situations that we are facing. And not as an adult, these are traumatic experiences that have happened to children um, at a very early age. And th there is a correlation that has been proven that the higher your risk factors, risk factors are those things that I was discussing earlier, you know, um, abuse or neglect, um, substance abuse, substance abuse, um, incarcerated parent, um, mm -hmm. um, separated or divorced parents. Um, those are all traumatic experiences. And we may not view them as traumatic experience, but the body does. And what happens to the body is it responds. It, it, it makes me feel like when I um, say I have 10,000 tasks to do at work, and although I think I'm juggling them or I'm doing them and hopefully well, my body is still responding to that stress. And the same thing happens to children, but because they are yet still developing, their brain is still growing and um, that type of traumatic stress is um, releasing those cortisones and is really impacting um, their, 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 health. their DNA and so the signs that we see maybe not as a three-year-old is so impactful as an adult and what I am proud to say is that I work with a team that is really helping children to become resilient to really identify our own stressors as adults um, and our own triggers um, and our own traumatic stress how do we deal with our own traumatic stress so that we are on a neutral playing field and we can really be supportive of children? That's just part of our interview with Pat and Washia. You might want to check out the website on Adverse Childhood Experiences, A-C-E. Look at the questions, take the test. More with Washia and Pat in another program. That's Schooling Around for this week. Thanks to Russell Courier at the controls, our editor Dan Zweiss, and you for watching. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local.